Coming up in a sec on Art Rocks, how you blend art with science to shine a light on the perils of species loss. Ecosystems that can't support diversity of life, the more of those species that disappear, the more fragile those ecosystems become. For one American opera singer, flexibility pays off. That's all about to happen on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith from Country Roads Magazine. Here's a subject that impacts all of us one way and another, the disappearance of flora and fauna that once flourished in our part of the world. Brandon Ballinger holds a transdisciplinary doctorate degree in art and biology. He uses that background to research, explore and to inform his audience about the dangers posed by species loss. And not just to members to those same species either. Brandon often uses art to drive the subject home. So listen up. When species start to disappear, we worry about ecosystems being impacted. The more those species that disappear, the more fragile those ecosystems become. Ecosystems that can't support diversity of life, in the long term they can't support us either. We need bees, we need butterflies, we need plankton, we need all those other organisms around us to help us with the food that we have, to help us with clean water, to help us with the air that we breathe. So as those things disappear, ecosystems start to not function. We're part of ecosystems, whether we realize it or not. We need them and they need us. This is a body of work called Frameworks of Absence that I've been working on for uh, probably about a decade now. It was really born out of frustration, trying to sort out how do you depict extinction. When we're talking about the death of people around us, individuals, it's hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to kind of come to terms with, let alone the, the loss of an entire group of organisms that have been here for tens of millions of years and then referencing a work that Robert Rauschenberg got a drawing by William de Kooning and erased it and I saw that at San Francisco MoMA many years ago I thought well okay I'm gonna erase them but then there was still this trace evidence that was left there were still these kind of lingering something and it looked like a ghost it didn't look like a again it wasn't a, a total absence and then I think at some point out of frustration I just cut one out of a passenger pigeon out of an old field guide and I held it up I said oh that's it somehow I've managed to frame absence and that's really how the series was born so then adding on to that idea what I started to do is try to find artifacts that were printed or created at the moment when that particular animal disappeared the artifacts at this point date from literally the 16th century all the way to very recent present for example there's an image of an ivory-billed woodpecker a Louisiana species and a species that disappeared in Louisiana. So I found the field guide that the last depiction was drawn in. And so literally I cut that from a book from the 1940s. So the last time a confirmed agreed sighting of a Louisiana, ivory billed woodpecker in Louisiana. So that was really important because instead of cutting a kind of a copy of an artifact, I felt like it was relating to changing that moment in history the same way that the actual organism disappeared. I would never do this with an original painting or drawing. The fact that these were all multiples, even if they were just a few. I felt it was really important to get an artifact from that moment in history. So it had some kind of residual quality of being around at that same moment. And then also by having antique objects that have been altered, it starts to push and pull into play. Like, where do we place our value? Do we covet objects that depict these organisms or do we like actually want to try to protect what's here and what has been around us and what we're losing? When I'm cutting them out, I have to be completely focused. I use exacto uh, blades and I'll often use dozens of blades on a single work of art. For example, the Florida Black Wolf, I must have used 80 exacto blades because what happens is you use them just for a few moments and then they dull. And if you're using a dull blade, it'll catch the paper and tear it and not cut it. 
Once the, the animal really is removed from the picture, then what I do is I burn it and then I place it in these little funerary urns that are etched with the name of the species and then I ask people to scatter the ashes. The hope there is really if you've ever scattered ashes of a loved one, it changes you and it's something you cannot forget. It sticks with you and that's what I hope that when people do that, it somehow connects them to this missing animal, you know, this missing uh, organism in history and, and hopefully uh, inspires them through emotion to want to wanna protect what we have. With the frameworks of absence, what I've done for now almost a decade is when I exhibit them, I try to show them as an installation, so they're in groupings. The prints all came from a gallery in New York. There are about 60 of them. And then the specimens that you see were borrowed on the artist's behalf by the museum from two other collections here in Baton Rouge at Louisiana State University. One is the Louisiana State University Museum of Natural Science, and the other is the Louisiana State Arthropod Museum. It's most effective not just because of the prints, but because of the mounted specimens. I think they really bring home the fact that we do have so many species that are lost, and by seeing the, not just a print, but an actual specimen that still has the look and feel of the animal makes it so much more palpable and tangible to bring home that fact that these are animals that we'll, we'll never see again. The prints on the wall are organized chronologically, starting with the earliest extinction through to the most recent, where on the wall behind me you see how it's crescendoed into what's closest to our own time frame to show the escalation of extinction that's occurring today. Then each print has a number next to it and the numbers correspond to those in the Book of the Dead, which is an iPad that Brandon has created that shows a picture of the animal before he cut them out. The United Nations just recently published this first ever uh, meta-study, meaning that it's a, a study that took years and years to create with hundreds of scientists from all over the world. And what we're seeing everywhere is loss. And loss of species at a really, really fast rate. So, I mean, right now, in this very moment, we're in the middle of a mass extinction event. Most of us don't even know it or don't realize it, and it's not obvious. But it's happening, and it's happening really, really quickly. And what this study shows is that of the known species, there are almost a million that are at risk of extinction, like, next few years, really. I did my graduate PhD work on amphibians. And um, amphibians are frogs, toads, salamanders. There's critters that don't have scales. They have slimy skin. They lay their eggs mostly in the water. They have tadpoles and little larvae that develop in the water, usually. There's about 7,000 known species and we've lost about 1% for every year I've been alive on this planet. I just turned 45. The guesstimate now is it's about 43% of the global amphibian population have disappeared in my lifetime. That's horrifying. These guys are super important in that they're not at the top of the food chain, they're not at the bottom, they're right here, and they do so many things to help the food chain work. So they're food for other organisms. They're also eating pests, so eating mosquitoes and things that help us directly. They're really kind of what's called a cornerstone species. So to lose that many so rapidly is alarming. And now there's a big study about insects. And what do we see there? Well, we're seeing similar declines in insects. Arthropods like that, insects and arthropods, they're so important. If, if we don't have pollinating insects, we do not have food. That's just bottom line. So to figure out what's impacting species like amphibians and insects and to try to figure out ways that we can curb our behavior and help them so that they can help us is really, really important for you know, our survival in the long run. So there's lots of things that we can do as individuals. So the top of the list is to learn. Just spend a few minutes trying to find out what's going on locally that you can protect and ways that you can do it by planting certain plants, by not mowing a certain section of your grass. What we're trying to do is my wife and our two little people, 
We have a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. We bought nine acres of soy field and have been transforming it back into prairie habitat and planting a, a, a baby forest there and putting in a wood duck pond to create habitat. And then we do community outreach projects there. It's just a little family owned nature reserve. And what we've seen already, even though we've only been doing it about three years is tons of animals are coming back. We've got loads of monarch butterflies, which is now being weighed out if that's gonna be considered a federally endangered species or not. Um, certainly have disappeared by upwards of 98% in some populations recently. We've got a bunch of fireflies that are starting to come back. There are easy things that we can do, and this is just one example. We just wanted to get a section of land and transform it back to what it would have looked like 500 years ago and see if the animals would come back, and sure enough, they are. And then share that story with folks when they come to visit us. There's culture all around, the trick is knowing where to look. To help you do that, here are just a few of the exhibits, the events and festivals coming soon to towns near you. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, keep your eyes peeled for a copy of Country Roads magazine. And while we're at it, LPB's Art Rocks website features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any episode again, just log on to lpb.org. Here's a performing artist who has worn many hats. Sujil Bibbs was already an internationally renowned opera singer when she started starring in her own one-woman musicals about little-known African-American heroines. Bibbs has also been a teacher, a filmmaker, a scholar and a public media producer. The thread that ties this entire career together? Storyteller. The arts are so important. And I don't say that because I spent my life in the arts. The arts give you abilities. The arts give you structure. When I went to Sumner High School, which um, is the oldest African-American high school west of the Mississippi, there was a great choir called the Sumner Acapella Choir. And I wanted to sing in that choir. I realized that singing was a really valuable thing and that I could do something special and I became the youngest legend singer. My highest point of my opera career was with the Opera Company of Boston and with the Santa Fe Opera. Singing in before large audiences was really thrilling. I sang with Regine Crespin, a very famous singer, and I sang in the Trojans, a very, very long opera. And I got wonderful reviews all over the world. I went to Europe right after that and uh, had a chance to be chosen to sing for television uh, in Germany and Austria for the Salzburg Festival. And then I started to get really ill. I didn't realize that I was allergic to wine, so I became ill uh, and I kept getting bronchitis, which is, you know, deadly for a singer. And so finally, after three years, even though I was offered a world premiere with the Opera Company of Boston, a leading role, I just called up one day and said, I can't do this anymore. Well, I thought then, if you're not singing, which is what you've always thought you were going to do, what are you going to do? I knew Chris Sarson at WGBH in Boston, and I had done an opera with him, so I contacted them, and he was the creator of Zoom. He decided that I could come on and train and choose the children for Zoom. I had this little career at first as a um, talent coordinator at, on Zoom, 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 you know. Then that went into being offered by Paula Apsel, who's now what we call the supernova at Nova. She had a little show called The Spider's Web. 
I took it and I produced this radio show and it went to NPR. I would say, when one door closes, look at yourself and open others. The next thing I knew, I was executive producer of Zoom. I think it's important not to uh, let people tell you what the limits are because there aren't any. There is, you are as limited as your imagination. My storytelling as a singer, I think, set my mind to that kind of thing of appreciation of story. When I came back to singing after years as a producer, I was singing classical song again. People kept telling me about stories. One night after singing at Herbst um, Theater in San Francisco, we were sitting around the table with Jacqueline Hairston, the great uh, composer, and she said, I want to write a story about Mary Ellen Pleasant. I went, Mary Ellen who? My name is Mary Pleasant, and I come a long way. I started going into the archives. It was like a great mystery that I had to solve. The way she lived her life, becoming a millionaire from being a slave, um, being an entrepreneur, being inclusive, those stories have to come out. They have to inspire the next generation. It matters that we have inspiration. And, and not just African-American stories, but these stories inspire all people. And the higher sisters also were an inspiration. Here were these opera singers, people like me, who spent their whole lives wanting to be great singers. And all of a sudden, boom, they change. And they're going to not go to Europe. And they're going to do these musicals about the African-American experience. And boy, I wanted to know why. But I want people to see something in what I'm doing or what I present that will inspire them to do something. The arts can really um, go beyond what we as individuals hold as our little structures and biases. And that's been proved time and time again. I'm still here. <laughs> as long as I'm still here, then I have something to do. Changing our tune now from opera to jazz. While serving in the Army Reserve, Justin Eccles suffered a car accident that left him with serious injuries. The Oklahoma City police officer believes that experience helped him find his true calling, both in public safety and in music. Eccles has performed with jazz masters in the US and Europe and now plays regularly in his hometown too. Here's Eccles to tell us why he thinks that some things are just meant to be. I think I'm multidimensional. I think I have sides to me. Maybe like a Rubik's Cube. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? I sang in the chorus and I sang, I would sing in church, but so far as uh, performing in secular music, it was not even anywhere on my radar. Whenever you're in trouble, you I think it's a meant to be thing. It's a it's a calling thing. It's spiritual. The longer I do this, the more I get in touch with that piece of it. You know? Hey, thank you, thank you. My name is Justin Eccles. I am a jazz pianist, a blues guitarist, and an Oklahoma City police officer. Testing one two. How are you all doing? Yeah. Oh, you're doing better than that. How are you doing? Justin Eccles is working his day job. I am a policeman and I am a musician, so I do both. And so part of your career day was I got to expose you both to police work and to music. So I'm going to play a little bit of piano and we'll see where we go from there, all right? He's a 17-year veteran of the Oklahoma City Police Department, and for most of that career, he's worked with children as a community relations officer. You're the one I long for, all I 
I'm, I've done it long enough. I'm, I'm seeing them all grown up now. And they're in college and they're saying, did you teach my D.A.R.E. class in the fifth grade? And, what do you think about that, guy? But Justin didn't always work with children. At the beginning of his tenure, he patrolled the streets. But a tragedy drastically changed his life and his work. I was a soldier with the U.S. Army Reserve. I was activated during Operation Iraqi Freedom. During that, I was in a head-on collision and uh, had a severe injury to my spine. Um, that ended up with me discharged from the, the military. So I was, uh, I was dealing with who I was as a person, as a man, uh, as a police officer, now that I had serious physical limitations. Only you as it turned out, Harry Connick Jr. had the answers to Justin's problems. I remember watching Harry Connick Jr. play a concert called The Other Hours. And I said to myself, I remember sitting on the couch saying to myself, if I can't be a police officer anymore, then I want to do that. And I knew uh, after I watched him play that that was going to be my next journey. Um, because I think realistically when you are in a state of exigence, you are always going to fall back on your natural strength. It's all you have. And so music was the natural gift. And I fell back on it. I fell into it. I'm glad that I'm the one who found you. Justin taught himself how to play piano, practicing That's three to five hours a day. Hanging around you. I would practice before work. I'd practice after I got off work. I, on my days off, I would practice holidays. Uh, if I was going out of town, I do. he found teachers to help him improve. So I spent a year uh, forcing myself to study classical. So we went through, I went from, you know, Mary Had a Little Lamb quickly to Furlease and Bach and Bergmuller and some of that stuff, and then, uh, and then uh, quickly transitioned uh, into playing jazz. Do I love you? Oh my, do I? I said, After the accident led him to Harry Connick Jr. and Harry Connick Jr. led him to jazz, Justin's passion led him to take another seminal step. Did I do? He decided to record a demo CD having no idea that just days later, that CD would change his life again. That CD ended up in the hands of Wynton Marcellus in New York City at Lincoln Center. I, I, I think it, it was probably a day or two after it was sent to him, I got a phone call uh, telling me that I needed to be in New York City in a month. And that was the beginning of five years of studying with uh, Antonio Chiaca, Italian uh, pianist, and jazz composer. Chase your dreams. And uh, now I was playing with uh, members of Harry Connick's band in New York City at different jazz venues. Life. In 2012, Justin was inducted into the Oklahoma Jazz Hall of Fame with the Legacy Tribute Award. Today, at the age of 39, two years away from retirement, this jazz musician slash police officer is taking stock and he's preparing to pivot yet again. My family still owns the property that my ancestors were slaves on. We still own it. So my folks are from Mississippi, and uh, from Bahalia, Mississippi, and Memphis. And I, I went to my grandmother's funeral, um, in, and my aunt's funeral, uh, just after that. 
in Memphis and was able to travel to Bahalia. This was during the time I was just kind of bending my ear to blues guitar. And blues kind of evolved out of me being in Mississippi. So there's this, there's this chapter in my life that's connected to Delta Blues. It's in my blood. And so I'm exploring that. Throughout his musical journey, just... Well, that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, art lover, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if that's not enough for you, Country Roads Magazine is a great resource for enriching your cultural life with art, cuisine, escapes and events all across the state. Until next week, I've been James Fox Smith and thank you for watching. <laughs>